We we're talking about uh, types of reactions and different ways to <clears throat> classify reactions. And really, uh, as we talked about, there's pretty much three reasons why a, a reaction does take place. Uh, basically, those three sort of driving forces for a chemical reaction is an electron transfer, the formation of a solid, and lastly, really the kind of the formation of water. And really all reactions can sort of be classified as pretty much one of these sort of things uh, basically occurring. And there's really kind of two big uh, umbrellas of types of reactions uh, that most of these will fall under. And the really first one that we talked about last time was uh, double displacement reactions. And double displacement reactions, again, the way you can recognize it is you got something like this. And what these two things are, are ionic compounds. So you basically have a positive and negative guy. And always in double displacement reactions, pretty much the positive guys will switch partners. And the result of that is you will form two new ionic compounds on the other side. And in certain cases, the double displacement reaction basically covers uh, these two things here. Um, in one case, we could get a more kind of specific classification, which is a precipitation reaction. And that basically means that some type of solid has been formed or a precipitate. So perhaps one of these guys, based on solubility rules that we also talked about, uh, when they come together, they make some type of solid. Another sort of uh, subcategory of double displacement reactions are really acid-base reactions. And pretty much when you take an acid plus a base, especially a strong acid and strong base, you always make a salt plus water. A salt, again, is an ionic compound. And obviously there is our formation of water, which is really the other reason, uh, again, a chemical reaction occurs. We also talked about three types of reactions or equations that you could write in relationship to these uh, guys here. And that is again, obviously the molecular equation. Like some silver nitrate plus some sodium chloride make some silver chloride, which is a solid and some sodium nitrate here. And that would be our uh, molecular equation. When we write a total ionic equation or a complete ionic equation, we break apart everything that's a strong electrolyte, um, anything that is a weak electrolyte, a solid, a liquid, or a gas stays together. Uh, so these guys would break apart. Uh, so would the sodium chloride. Here, this being a solid would stay together. Otherwise, it would not be a solid anymore. And we would have our sodium nitrate, which would also break apart into ions. So this is the sort of second type of equation, which again is referred to as total ionic or complete ionic. In this equation, typically you should be able to find some ions that are the same on both sides. Uh, so in this case, sodium and nitrate are the same on both sides. These are our spectator ions. And again, as we talked about, they basically are there to uh, balance out the charge. Uh, they're really not there to form uh, the main product of this reaction. So typically what we do is we cancel them out completely on both sides. That leaves us our third type of equation that we talked about, which is our net ionic equation, uh, which in this case would be basically what is happening is the silver from the silver nitrate is going to find our chloride from the sodium chloride, and it's going to make a solid here of silver chloride. 
the net ionic equation pretty much uh, tells us exactly sort of what is happening in this reaction, what is really the main sort of product that is being formed. In both of these equations, the total ionic and the net ionic, that implies ions, yes? So again, you do need to make sure that you include the charges when you write those uh, equations uh, on everybody that obviously is an ion. <clears throat> yeah. It does. So you, you would, uh, for example, if we had a HF here, which is a weak acid and a weak electrolyte, and we reacted it with, say, something like sodium hydroxide, we would get uh, some NaF, and we would get some water here. And in this case, when we get to the uh, total ionic equation, uh, because this is a weak electrolyte, uh, we would keep it together. So it would still stay together. The sodium hydroxide would break apart. The sodium fluoride here would also break apart. And obviously our water here, which is a liquid, would stay together. In this case, because we do have that sort of weak electrolyte there, when we come to our spectator ions, we're actually just left with just sodium being the spectator ions here, uh, which would get canceled out. And that would leave us this as our net ionic equation, which has obviously our weak electrolyte still intact there. So Uh, if it's an acid, if it's an acid, it will always be aqueous because that's basically the definition of an acid is it uh, basically is in solution. So it can produce some H plus, so it will always have to be uh, an aqueous guy. And you wouldn't necessarily um, maybe find this one, or you might find it on on the solubility, but maybe not. Yeah. Yeah. So if it is classified as a weak acid, then that would imply that it's aqueous at that point. Yeah. Question over here. They would be in technically, there would be no reaction because nothing would come together. So you wouldn't get any formation of a solid. You wouldn't make any water in that case. You basically just still have ions floating around basically in there. Yeah. Uh, so I think we did one in the uh, notes like that where they all canceled out and essentially it's basically no reaction. You know? <clears throat> Other questions? And it's because of that, they basically all cancel out at that point. Okay, uh, so that is uh, what we talked about last time. We're then gonna talk about really sort of the other classification of reactions, which uh, fulfills the transfer of electrons. And those are basically redox reactions. So kind of the two big umbrellas of reactions, double displacement reactions, which basically house your precipitation reactions and your acid base reactions and redox reactions which pretty much house every other reaction known to man uh, will basically go into the redox uh, sort of category so as we will see as we go through this there's more specific ways to classify reactions uh, that will fall under this uh, redox classification <clears throat> So redox reactions, uh, which is where we left off there in the notes, are really these oxidation reduction reactions. And short, basically, is redox reactions. Oxidation and reduction have its own definition. So let's go over that actually first here. So when we talk about oxidation reactions, that is usually when somebody has lost electrons or loses electrons. Oxid uh, reduction, on the other hand, is when somebody will gain electrons. So sometimes people 
remember this as like Leo the lion goes grr. Loss of electrons oxidation, gaining of electrons reduction. People are fond of the oil rig. Oxidizing is losing. Reducing is gaining. Use them both together. Put Leo the lion on the oil rig. He'll go grr. You don't have to choose or any of those things. But uh, there's also a few other definitions that honestly here in sort of general chemistry, we don't really use a lot. Uh, but another definition of oxidation is the gaining of oxygen from reactants to products. And another definition of oxidation is actually the losing of hydrogen as you go from reactants to products. So those are two other definitions of oxidation. Like I said, we really don't get too much into those definitions here. If you take organic chemistry, you use those definitions a lot. Uh, reduction would have the opposite here. It is the losing of oxygen as you go from reactants to products. And it is the gaining of H2 as you go from reactants to products. So again, in here, we really, most of the time look at electrons as our definition, uh, but occasionally those other two do pop up along the way. So when we think about if something is being oxidized or something is being reduced, the good news is it always occurs together. So if there is something that is being oxidized, there is something that is being reduced and obviously vice versa. So the good news is if you could just figure out one of the two, the other guy is doing the opposite thing. So that makes it kind of nice uh, in that sense. How do we figure it out? In most cases, what we look at, as we'll talk about here, is what is referred to as the oxidation number, our state. And it's sort of the uh, charge that the element has when it is sort of sharing electrons within an atom. And there's really a, a very, very simple way to figure out what is being oxidized, what is being reduced. You could roll the old classic number line. And to the right of zero used to be positive numbers. I think to the left used to be negative numbers there. So if something is going through oxidation and losing electrons, would it become more negative or more positive? should become more positive as it has less electrons, more protons. So if you look at the oxidation state of the species on the left-hand side of the arrow to the right-hand side of the arrow, and you see it is kind of moving in this direction, the more positive direction. That means that guy is going through oxidation. Now, if somebody gains electrons, they are becoming more negative as they have more electrons than they started with, right? So. If you look at the oxidation state of something on the left-hand side of the arrow to the right-hand side of the arrow, and it is basically moving in this direction, becoming more negative, uh, that means that that thing will go through reduction. So just very simply, you can move one way or the other, and you can very quickly sort of determine, you know, is that thing going through oxidation or reduction? When we look at an oxidation reaction, um, and it's sometimes referred to, as we will see here in a second, oxidation half reaction. What we have is, thank you, a reaction that looks like this. And what we see is the electrons are always on the product side, like they are being lost or being given off. So if you see sort of a reaction that has electrons in it and electrons there on the product side, that is definitely an oxidation sort of event that's occurring. A reduction half reaction, as we will see, has the opposite here. We see the electrons uh, on our reactant side, like they're being gained. So a lot of times in sort of redox reactions, we look at these sort of half reactions. We look at the oxidation part or the reduction part. And again, based on the side that you see the electrons, uh, will give you an idea as to what is happening in that case. Electrons should never be on the same side when you write these two type of reactions because the, somebody should be losing and somebody should be gaining electrons. All right, any questions on that so far there? Question? No. <clears throat> 
Okay, so let's talk a little bit more about this. So if we look at magnesium um, going through this reaction with oxygen to form magnesium oxide, <clears throat> if we look at what is happening here, just on this side of the equation here, we've got our magnesium plus some oxygen make some magnesium oxide. <clears throat> All right, so in this particular case, if we look at the oxidation states of everybody, uh, again, it is a little bit different than the charges when we talk about oxidation states, but this is magnesium, which is by itself, anything from the periodic table, a reminder that is by itself uncombined, uh, really has no charge or oxidation state, so it is zero. That is naturally how it comes. The oxygen there, which is O2, that also is naturally how oxygen comes, which is a zero. It is when these two guys get together, right? Here are metal and non-metal that they make an ionic compound and that they actually gain charges at that point. And magnesium here has a plus two charge, right? And oxygen here has a minus two charge when they do come together. So we could simply use, like I mentioned before, our little number line here to figure out what is happening. If we look at the magnesium, magnesium started at zero and it ended on the right-hand side at plus two, which means it is moving in that direction, is becoming more positive. And that means that it is the magnesium here that is going through oxidation. And frankly, as soon as I identify that as going through oxidation, by default, that means that that guy is going to go through reduction. And you can still do it for the oxygen as well. If we look at the oxygen, it also started at zero. And on the right-hand side, it ended at minus two, which means it is becoming more negative, which means it is going through reduction. So, the nice thing, like I said, is if you identify one, the other guy, you don't really have to think about it too hard, should be doing the opposite thing because they always occur together. Uh, but you can, again, very simply use a little number line like that and figure out what is happening here. <clears throat> so if we take this reaction and really break it up into its two half reactions, this is our oxidation half reaction. Here we see magnesium going from zero to plus two and we see our electrons coming off on a product side, which indicates that it is a oxidation half reaction. And we see on this guy here that those electrons are now going to be gained by the oxygen there. And it is going from zero to minus two. Why is there four electrons total? There's how many magnesiums? Two, each one loses how many electrons? Two, two and two is four. Yeah, so in this balance equation, each magnesium is laying up two electrons, right? For a grand total of four electrons at that point. Uh, so that's why it's four there and obviously not two electrons because it is the balanced half reactions that we see here. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now these half reactions are oftentimes written and very simple redox reactions, what you essentially do is you add these half reactions back together. Now, anything on opposite sides of the arrow can cancel out or reduce down. You think of the arrow like an equal sign, you know, kind of subtract it to the other side. The one thing that you always have to make sure you do before you go to sort of add these back together is uh, you got to make sure that the number of electrons in each half reaction are the same. Because the idea here is however many electrons somebody loses should be the exact same number of electrons that somebody gains. So let's just say, for example, I have this, like, say, some silver. Actually, And we'll just use our oxygen here. And this really bad example here.
We'll just use that. All right, so say we put these two half reactions together. When we go to add it, we only have one electron here, but four electrons here. So we would have to actually multiply the silver half reaction by four before we added it back together. And that would be four silvers, four silver pluses, and four electrons. And using our half reaction from below, we now can cross out those electrons in this really bad example that's not probably going to work correctly, but we'll go with it. Um, <clears throat> but you always want to make sure that the number of electrons there uh, always equal each other. So it may require you in certain cases, if you're adding half reactions back together, you might have to multiply one of the reactions by a number, or you may have to multiply both half reactions by a number to get them to the same number of electrons. Or like in the case here, you don't have to multiply by any number. So um, those are your options, but definitely always want to keep in mind electrons should always be on opposite sides of the arrow in these half reactions, and they always got to be the same number before you put them back together to get the overall reaction. So putting these guys back together, keeping everything on the left-hand side of the arrow on the left-hand side of the arrow, and everything on the right-hand side on the right-hand side of the arrow, we get this reaction here. Again, the electrons on the left and on the right here will cancel out, and that leaves us our overall reaction that takes place. That is why these are called half reactions because they're half of what is going on, right? Each of them, the oxidation is half of what's going on. The reduction is the other half. Any questions on that there? Yeah. No, that is the overall reaction when I circled. The half reactions would be uh, this one and this one, yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> All right, so um, another important thing here where to go, is the idea of oxidizing agent and reducing agent. So just so we're clear, the reducing agent and oxidizing agent is actually a different thing then the question of what is being oxidized and what is being reduced. So somebody adds a little agent on the end of it, it's actually asking you something different. The oxidizing agent is the substance that gets reduced, while the reducing agent is the substance that gets oxidized. So why is that? So the oxidizing agent is the guy that gets reduced. In order for it to get reduced, it needs to gain electrons, right? In order for it to gain electrons, it's got to cause somebody else to lose electrons. So it is causing the oxidation in somebody else. Vice versa there for the reducing agent. In order for the reducing agent to be oxidized, somebody else needs electrons, which is going to cause his oxidation. And that is what the reducing agent is. So if we look at our example there, we just looked at, which was our magnesium uh, plus our oxygen goes to MgO. This guy here, as we talked about, is the guy being oxidized. This was the guy being reduced, which means the magnesium here is our reducing agent. And the oxygen here is our oxidizing agent. So in that particular example, that would be where you find them. By the way, that is where you find those guys, yes? The guy being oxidized, the guy being reduced, the oxidizing agent and the reducing agent reactant side of the equation is where you find them. So always on the reactant side is where you find those guys. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> So let's take a look at another one here. Uh, so if we look at this one, which is a single replacement reaction here, this is zinc, which is by itself, it has no charge. This is actually copper two sulfate, uh, which means the copper here has a plus two charge. The sulfate has a minus two. On the right-hand side, the zinc, Sulfate, zinc here now has a plus two charge. That's a minus two. 
And the copper is by itself, which means it has a zero oxidation state. What is being oxidized here and what is being reduced? That is right. So again, if you're not sure, we take a look at our little number scheme here. Our zinc is starting at zero. It is ending at plus two, which means the zinc is becoming more positive and going through oxidation. While if we look at the copper, copper started at plus two, which would have been over here and ended at zero, which would be going in that way, becoming more negative. And again, that would mean that it is the copper that is going through reduction here. What about sulfate? Anything happen with that? There's nothing happening with that. There's really no change as you go from left to right. The reducing agent in this case would then be, it is the zinc, which would be our reducing agent. It is the guy being oxidized. And it is the copper, not really the whole thing. It's the copper two there that is our oxidizing agent in this particular case. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> now, normally we do sort of follow uh, molecular total ionic and net ionic equations a lot of times with double displacement reactions, but we could actually write those equations for this one as well. And if we did that, we would have our zinc, which would stay together. We would have our copper two sulfate, which would break apart. We have our zinc sulfate, which would also break apart. And we would have our copper here, which would obviously stay together as it is a solid. In this particular case, our spectator ion is the sulfate, right? Which as we just talked about is not changing in this reaction. And this gives us a net ionic equation for this redox reaction, which basically tells you what is happening in this case. That looks something like this. It is basically uh, <clears throat> this zinc that's going to transfer two electrons over to the copper. Copper two is gonna pick up those two electrons and then have no charge. And obviously when the zinc loses those two electrons, uh, it becomes zinc with a plus two charge. Hence here, a transfer of electrons. Why this takes place, again, is one of the reasons why a reaction takes place, that transfer of electron. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> All right, so why don't you uh, work this one out? The next one, copper wire reacts with silver nitrate to form silver metal. What is the oxidizing agent? I would say common charge on copper will become plus two, if that helps. Okay, so let's take a look and we first probably should start with an equation. So copper wire is really just solid copper, right? So again, has no charge if it's by itself. Reacts with uh, silver nitrate, that's a little AgNO3. And of course, you know your solubility rules, so nitrates are always soluble. Uh, it forms a uh, silver metal. And really, that's all you need to answer the question. But again, in case you're curious, it is a little copper two nitrate coming off there. And I suppose a little balancing like I am a chemistry instructor. There we go, a little two there action. All right, so that's the overall equation. And really, if you couldn't get this part, this part is enough to help you decide what is going on. So if we look at really our oxidation states here on the left-hand side, once again, copper by itself has really a zero oxidation state. This is silver nitrate, which is an ionic compound. So they have their normal sort of charge. So silver is plus one, right? We'll just do the whole nitrate is minus one, basically. On the right-hand side, our silver now becomes zero. And in this case, our copper plus two and minus one. But again, if we just had the silver by itself, we could look at just the silver here and we see that the silver started at plus one and ended at zero, which means the silver is being oxidized or reduced. The silver here is being 
reduced, right? It is basically becoming more negative, which means by default, even if I couldn't get the guy over here, this guy should be the guy being oxidized, which we could see because it started at zero and really does end at plus two, which means it's becoming more positive in this case. That means that the answer to the question here is the oxidizing agent is the, it is the silver. The oxidizing agent is that silver that's going basically uh, from plus one to zero. And our copper here would be our reducing agent. Once again here, nothing's happening with the nitrate. It really is a spectator ion. And if you got to the net ionic equation, it would look something like this. where our copper, once again, laying up a couple of electrons over there to our silvers and basically making our guys on the other side. Any questions on that there? <clears throat> yeah. Uh, that is probably a most common one that copper would probably jump to in, in most cases would be the plus two charge. It's almost a safe bet in most cases if you ever have like something being Copper being oxidized and you kind of need something on the other side, probably the plus two is the best one. It could do plus one, but it'd probably end up at plus two in most cases. Other questions? <clears throat> it is because in order for it to get reduced, it has to gain electrons, which causes the oxidation of somebody else. Yeah. Other questions? Yeah. So you could, the easy way to remember it is basically opposite of what's happening to it is the agent guy, right? Yeah. <clears throat> Other question? Come out. All right. So understanding oxidation numbers is obviously important to help you understand what is happening when we look at these sort of redox reactions. So let's talk about the proper way here to assign oxidation numbers or oxidation states. The oxidation number or oxidation state is not always the sort of charge that you associate with an element when it is in its ionic compound. So when we talk about naming and all those things we have in our head, like, you know, plus one, plus two, plus three, minus three, minus two, minus one. And that is absolutely what it will be uh, for the oxidation state if it is an ionic compound. So like we had silver nitrate is going to be plus one, you know, minus one. But when we get things that are covalently bonded together, Things do take on sort of a different charge, if you will, based on how they're sharing electrons, who they're sharing electrons with. Uh, so things that we normally, for example, associate as being like negative one, like say chlorine, can be positive oxidation numbers in a covalent compound because of how they're sharing electrons in that uh, sort of arrangement. So sometimes it's really hard for people to... Uh, sort of get past is like we beat it to your head, you know, it's minus one, it's minus two, you know, but again, and when you're signing oxidation states, it's not always going to match up the ionic sort of charge, if you will. So to assign it, the first one's pretty simple, like we kind of did there in those examples, anything that's pretty much an element by itself in its natural form, uncombined with anything else, will always have an oxidation state of zero. Any monoatomic ions, uh, the oxidation state will be its uh, charge. So again, if you had lithium, it will be plus one uh, because in most ionic compounds, it's going to be plus one. If you had iron three chloride, the iron three would be, the oxidation state would be plus three. Now, oxygen is really a good place to start with when you are assigning oxidation states. So if you have oxygen there, that's usually a, good one to start with and it should usually be minus two the exception is if it is not really oxygen but it is the polyatomic ion peroxide which is o2 two minus here yeah. as peroxide and that has an oxidation state of minus one so like hydrogen peroxide maybe a little sodium peroxide Kind of like mercury, that extra two kind of hangs around a lot. So you could kind of visualize it or you have the two on like the hydrogen or two on the sodium kind of hangs around uh, a lot of the time. So uh, 
Other than that, oxygen is really a good place to start with. Hydrogen is going to be plus one, except obviously in an ionic compound, if it comes second, it would then be minus one because it's hydride. Group one guys are plus one, group two are plus two, and fluorine is always negative one. When you add up all the oxidation numbers, it does need to equal the charge if it is an ion. So if you have an ion that's overall charge minus two, when you add up all your oxidation numbers, they need to add up to minus two. If you have something that is neutral, then everybody needs to add up to zero. Oxidation numbers do not need to be uh, integers. Uh, so for example, you could have like a minus uh, one half as the oxidation state. Um, so you can have kind of decimals, if you will, or fractions. But most of the time you'll hit probably whole numbers on, on most of them that you come with. So if we look at this guy here, which is our friend hydrogen carbonate or bicarbonate, in this sort of setup like so. In a setup, if you're going to assign oxidation numbers here and you got three elements together, the general rule is kind of go right to the oxygen, go left and save the guy in the middle for the end. So usually the guy in the middle is a good idea to save for the end. So we will start here with the oxygen, which is minus two in this case. And in this particular case, there are three of them, which gives us a minus six. Going to the left-hand side, our hydrogen would be plus one. Now this overall guy has a charge of minus one. And that means that when we add up our oxidation numbers here, it does need to equal minus one. So at this point, we got minus six and plus one, which is minus five. That means the oxidation state here on the carbon is going to be plus four, I believe. Plus four and plus one is plus five, plus five and minus six is minus one here. So just so we're clear, if you were asked to give the oxidation numbers or oxidation states for each of these elements, this is the correct answer. Hydrogen is plus one, carbon is plus four, and oxygen is minus two. Not the grand total of six there, uh, but you wanna give it for each one. The other important thing that you should always do when you write oxidation numbers or state is include the charges. So you need to include those charges when you're stating them. Even if it's positive, you need to lay up the plus in front of it. Um, and if it's negative, obviously you need to lay up the negative charge. So make sure that you do include the charges when you do so. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Really, really important to help you understand when you're looking at redox sort of reactions to understand the oxidation numbers of everybody because it makes you understand what is going on. Here's periodic table and again, uh, we see a lot of our common guys here. And again, you can see here, chlorine has a bunch of pluses, or maybe you can't see it either, but uh, <laughs> it puts the pluses and minus ones, even nitrogen, for example, MN has got a bunch of them. Uh, the common ones there are in red, and usually the common ones, a lot for our transition metals are plus two and plus three. Uh, but again, you can have definitely some oxidation states are different than the charges that we associate. So why don't you take a couple minutes here and give the oxidation numbers for each of these elements that are present, the I, the F, the sodium, the I, and the O, and the potassium, the chromium, and the oxygen. Let's take a look. Uh, so again, uh, we'll start here on the bottom left. Uh, we got a situation of three. We'll start on the right-hand side with the oxygen. Always a good place to start. Uh, that is definitely gonna be minus two in this case. Uh, there are three of them, which again gives us sort of a minus six. Going to the other side is a good place to start again, since that is sodium, which is group one. Uh, that will be a plus one oxidation state. So in this particular case, this thing has no charge overall, uh, which means our oxidation numbers need to add up to zero. That means that our iodide here is carrying a plus five oxidation state, which plus five and plus one is plus six and minus six is zero. So our sodium here, plus one, 
iodide there, our iodine plus five, and our oxygen minus two. Any questions on those assignments there? <clears throat> Coming up here top, we got fluorine, which is always minus one, because frankly, it is like the most electronegative element, even when it's bounded, right? It's gonna bring all those electrons towards itself. That is seven of them, which gives us minus seven, which has a zero here, overall charge. That means in this case, the iodine is actually carrying a, if I could do math there, plus seven there, oxidation state. Uh, so there are iodine here would be plus seven and our fluorine here would be minus one in this case. Now we can see the difference here between iodine and iodine here. In this case, because it's hooked up with fluorine in the top example, right? Fluorine being more electronegative is going to draw those electrons closer to the fluorine going to make the iodine more positive than what we see with like the oxygen's influence there, which is less electronegative than the iodine, yeah? or less electronegative than the fluorine. <clears throat> Any questions on that there? Why is it equal zero? Because uh, this, uh, this particular compound is neutral, right? It has no charge, so it's zero, yeah? Just like the first one here, this is really an ionic compound, right? And it has no charge. Uh, so that's why that one equals zero. If you took out just the iodate, which is this guy, right? And we have our sodium. This is how we get to the minus one charge because this again is minus two, which gives us a minus six equals minus one and a plus five here. And that is why we need one sodium to balance it out in this particular case, yeah. So that is what we work at. Now, this brings up a good point. Sometimes people, when they're counting up overall charges on one side and everything like that, wanna kind of go element by element. And to be honest with you, the polyatomic ion, overall charge did the math for you. So you don't need to go individually for each element there. The overall, oxidation states of all those guys in that polyatomic ion is going to add up to negative one. So later on, we're gonna talk about sort of figuring out the charge on each side and people wanna go element by element. But if you have a polyatomic ion, you don't really need to do that because frankly, it did it for you the math. So why do it twice? Any questions on that there? <clears throat> all right, last one here, a little potassium dichromate action. That is a minus two. That is seven times minus two is minus 14 in this case. Uh, we got a potassium, which each is plus one because it is group number one. And there are two of them. This again equals zero. The difference though is we don't have just one chromium, but we do have two of them. Uh, to get us to zero to begin with, right? We would need a plus 12 happening there. And since there are two of them, that means each of the chromiums there are going to carry a plus six charge or oxidation state. That means potassium here is plus one, chromium is plus six, and oxygen is minus two in this case. Yeah. Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, so the when you're assigning oxidation states, I would say probably in most cases, there's going to be a lot of times an oxygen involved, and that's usually always the good place to start with the oxygen. Uh, if there's not an oxygen involved, then probably maybe the more electronegative. So fluorine, for example, is always going to be minus one. So it's kind of got like a fixed charge. So you would start there in that particular case. Yeah. Other questions? <clears throat> So again, assigning oxidation states, really important to help our understanding of what is going on here. All right, now that we had our preview of redox, later the more complicated stuff will occur. Uh, we're gonna talk about subclassifications of redox reactions. So once again, the redox sort of reaction is the big sort of classification. And underneath that, you could more specifically classify reactions in multiple ways. You could frankly look at one reaction and classify it three different ways, depending on sort of what you are looking at. So the first sort of 
subclassification of a redox reaction is a combination reaction. And this is also sometimes referred to as a synthesis reaction. And basically in a combination or a synthesis reaction, two things make one is a very easy way to recognize it. I got two things make one thing basically. So much like the name implies, you're comboing things together, you're putting things together and that is the way you can recognize it. So if we look at this particular reaction here, <clears throat> We have aluminum plus bromine makes some aluminum bromide. That is two things make one thing. That is a classic synthesis or combination reaction. This is also still a redox reaction that's happening here. We look at the aluminum, the oxidation state is zero because it's by itself. We look at the bromine, oxidation state is zero because that is naturally how it comes. They do not get charges until they get over here. And on the right-hand side, the lumen has what charge? Plus three, and the bromine has minus one, right? So in this case, you know, if you rolled your number line and we looked at aluminum, started at zero, ends at plus three, which means the aluminum here is being oxidized. By default here, the bromine is being reduced and the reducing agent would be the aluminum, yes, and the oxidizing agent here would be the Br2, would be the bromine. By the way, that always happens, right? When metals and nonmetals come together, metals do what typically? Lose electrons, yeah, which means they get oxidized. Nonmetals typically gain electrons, right, and become negative, and they get reduced. So the simple answer is if you got like a metal and a nonmetal coming together to make an ionic compound, basically the metals being oxidized and the nonmetals being reduced. Yes, they can, yeah. So like any of those guys that we did, actually uh, the um, guy on the top there, like IF7, right? It's a covalent compound, yeah. So um, it could definitely happen in, in non-metals reactors. <clears throat> so this is a combination or synthesis can also be classified as a redox reaction. The next type is a decomposition reaction. And it's basically the opposite of a combination or synthesis. So combination or synthesis, we put it together, decomposition, we basically break it apart. So basically one thing makes two or more things. So that is your classic decomposition. Um, <clears throat> so for example, here, a little potassium chlorate makes some potassium chloride and oxygen. This is basically one thing making multiple things. Uh, water, run electrical current over it, get some hydrogen gas and some oxygen gas. I know, I'm going to balance it. There we go. Uh, one thing making two things, right? Decomposition reaction. If we look at our oxidation states here for potassium chlorate, you are going to tell me that the oxygen is minus two. You're going to tell me that the potassium is plus one. And you're going to tell me the chlorine's oxidation state there in the middle is. So that is a minus six. That's a plus one. It equals zero. It is a plus five in this case. I hope with the math there gets us to zero. Going to the right hand side, this is potassium chloride. So that's an ionic compound, which frankly means. The oxidation states are the charges that we normally expect with these guys. So our potassium here will be plus one, our chloride would be minus one, and our oxygen here would be zero. The substance that is getting oxidized in this case is... What species there is going through oxidation? Well, let's start with what thing is not changing at all. The potassium went from plus one to plus one. So that narrows down your option there. We got a chlorine or an oxygen. So for double jeopardy here, the one being oxidized is, it is oxygen in this case. Once again, if you look, oxygen started on the left-hand side at minus two, ended on the right-hand side at zero. 
going, becoming more positive. So it's going through oxidation. Chlorine started at plus five, which would be over here, ended at plus one, which means it's moving in this direction, becoming more negative and going through reduction, yeah? And once again here, really the potassium is just a spectator ion. Nothing's really happening with it. Uh, it's just there to hang out. So that is definitely a decomposition reaction and also obviously a redox reaction. How about our water? What is being oxidized here? What is being reduced in the water situation? It is a situation, what is happening? Let's start with the oxidation states in water. Oxygen is minus two, hydrogen is plus one, yeah? On the right-hand side, the H2 is zero. That's how it naturally comes, right? And the oxygen on the right-hand side is, which means the hydrogen is doing what? The hydrogen is actually being reduced there, which is good. I heard you catch yourself. So that started at plus one and it is ending at zero, right? So it's becoming more negative. It's being reduced. In this case, it is the oxygen that is starting at minus two on the left and ending at zero, heading in that direction, becoming more positive or going through oxidation. Any questions on that? So again, both of these here represent a decomposition reaction. They could also be classified more sort of broadly as a redox reaction that's also taking place. <clears throat> any questions on any of that stuff there? Kind of looks like he's burning his hand. I'm not sure. <laughs> All right, another, uh, let's look at the pictures. I feel like I'm doing that tomorrow. All right, that's good. All right, so another type of classification is a combustion reaction. And there's really kind of two combustion reactions that most people uh, think of. And I would say probably nine times out of 10, this is not the combustion reaction most people think of. Uh, it is that organic combustion that we talked about when we did empirical formulas and all that good stuff there where you take an organic guy that is carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen, you react it with some O2, you make CO2 and water. This is sometimes referred to as a combustion reaction, or in most cases, and it is more of an organic combustion reaction. But really your bare bone definition of a combustion reaction is frankly, any reaction where you got that guy right there on the left-hand side of the arrow. So. That's pretty much all you need for it to be technically classified as a combustion reaction. But I would say in everyday talk, when you're having these conversations about types of reactions with your friends, uh, you're probably all uh, referring to probably that uh, organic combustion reaction. I don't know, maybe that happens, I'm not sure. But uh, here we look here, we got sulfur, we have our oxygen here, uh, which will make it a combustion reaction. By the way, that would also be what type of reaction that we just talked about? I see two things that make one thing. That's also a combination or synthesis reaction. And as you probably know, this will then also be a zero, zero, minus two plus four situation. That is also a redox reaction as well. So right there, three different classifications for the same reaction depending on what you're looking at, they all actually fit the bill here. In this case, uh, my oxidizing agent is which one? The oxidizing agent is, it is the oxygen because it is being reduced, right? So the oxygen here is going from zero to minus two, which means it's being reduced and it would be our, oxidizing agent or reducing agent would be this guy, which is being oxidized as it goes from zero to plus four in this particular case. Down here is our magnesium and our oxygen. Two things make one thing, could also be a synthesis or combination reaction. This is gonna be a combustion reaction because there's oxygen. And once again, it is going to be a redox reaction as we talked about earlier the magnesium being oxidized and the oxygen in this case being reduced. That is my favorite experiment because they tell you to observe what happens, but don't look directly at it as it burns. 
because it's super bright and you blind yourself if you ever did that which as i'm demonstrating that i'm looking directly at it of course but uh you shouldn't do that so you don't do that here though i don't like to think they let you burn magnesium here did you do it in the previous class oh my mistake they let you burn magnesium it was a demonstration don't look directly at it, but but make sure you record what is happening. All right, but it is bright enough, I guess. Technically, you should be able to kind of see it happening. All right, so combustion reaction again is uh, has to have O2 on the left hand side there, oxygen gas, and it is still a redox reaction. Now, another type of uh, redox reaction is a classification. Most people call this uh, single replacement reactions. And in a single replacement reaction, you typically have this sort of setup here, where this here really either and this guy is an ionic compound. And these are pretty much like those reactions we did way back when we did that experiment with the halogens, right? And I wrote them all up on the board. We have the different layers. And if this guy is a metal, it will come in and kick out the positive guy because metals typically make positive charges. And if this guy was a non-metal, it would come in and kick out the negative guy if it uh, did happen. In order for this reaction to take place, the guy coming in needs to be more reactive than what it's replacing uh, in order for that reaction to take place. So if you remember, sometimes the top layer didn't change, right? So there was no movement and that sort of reaction there. So here's a couple of different, more specific displacement reactions. Uh, the first one's a hydrogen displacement. And in this particular case, the strontium, which has a zero oxidation state, oxygen is minus two and our hydrogen is plus one, will come in and kick out the hydrogen Whenever hydrogen gets kicked out, it becomes hydrogen gas on the other side. You see bubbles, you go, wow. And it then becomes an oxidation state of zero. Our strontium then gains a plus two charge happening in this case. And it is the strontium here that's actually going from zero to plus two, becoming more positive and going through oxidation. It is the hydrogen here that is going from plus one on the left-hand side to zero going in the more negative direction, being reduced. So this is a single replacement reaction. If you wanna be really more specific about it, it is a hydrogen uh, displacement reaction, and it is still a redox reaction that is happening in this case. In this second one here, we have a metal, which once again is our magnesium, no oxidation state. This is our TI, which is plus four, our chloride, which is minus one, in this case, the magnesium is going to come and kick out the metal. When it does so, the metal comes out by itself and now has a zero oxidation state. The magnesium gains a plus two charge and our chloride still has a minus one oxidation state. So this is a metal displacement because the metal is just replacing a metal, basically. And this, again, as you can see here, still a redox reaction occurring. It is the TI in this case, right, that is starting at plus four and ending at zero, which means it is being reduced. And it is the magnesium that is starting at zero and ending at plus two, uh, becoming more positive, which means it is being oxidized. And once again, here it is the chloride that's a spectator on. It's just kind of hanging out there. It's not really doing much in this case. So in this case, basically the magnesium is laying up some electrons over to the TI. TI is gaining those electrons, becoming reduced. And uh, for example, when you do these things, typically things with charges are aqueous, so they're in solution, yeah. And things that sort of uh, gain electrons become solid, they like drop out of solution. They kind of become solid in most cases. So the whole electrochemistry chapter next semester, uh, when you run galvanic cells and you have some metal electrodes, you know, you can kind of see it plating and coming out of solution sometimes uh, when these things happen. <clears throat> this is a halogen displacement, which is essentially what we did in that experiment. Um, 
We have our chlorine, which is a non-metal. We have our positive negative guy, which is plus one, minus one. In this case, the chlorine doesn't have a charge or oxidation state, but when it does, it becomes negative. So it comes in and actually kicks out the other negative guy. The result of that is we get our new ionic compound over here and the bromine comes out by itself. <clears throat> here, the chlorine is going from zero to minus one. So it's going from zero to minus one, moving to the left there, becoming more negative. So it is going through reduction. The bromine is starting at negative one and heading to zero, going to the right, becoming more positive and going through oxidation. The reactivity of the halogens is which way? Reactivity increases which way in the group seven? We did that experiment, remember? It goes up, right? So in this reaction, chlorine is higher on that list, right, than the bromine. So we would expect this reaction to take place. If we flipped it around, we would not expect it to take place if we started with the bromine on the outside, right? <clears throat> Any questions on that? Yeah. Yeah, so uh, so really hydroxide, if we just pulled it out, uh, is this. And uh, in this particular case, uh, the oxygen is still minus two, and then the hydrogen would be plus one. So we take minus two and plus one. That's where the overall minus one charge for hydroxide comes from. So in the case of the uh, oxygen on the left and on the right, uh, it's really not changing in that particular case. This particular hydrogen is actually not changing either, but this hydrogen is over here. Yeah. And that sometimes happens. You, you know, you can have something that kind of stays the same, but you have another one uh, that does change. <clears throat> Other questions? So an activity series is used to help us decide whether or not a reaction will take place. This is a fancy activity series here where it gets really specific about kind of what you need for this reaction to take place. A very simple sort of uh, activity series is one where you just have a list of elements and usually hydrogen somewhere in the middle. So almost if you just looked on the left-hand side here. And usually in this case, uh, anything that is higher on the list is more reactive than anybody lower on the list. So. Anybody sort of higher on the list um, will replace somebody lower on the list. So for example, if you had zinc up here and say you had copper here, if we reacted zinc with hydrochloric acid, we would expect the reaction to take place. If we reacted uh, copper, that's what that's supposed to be, uh, with hydrochloric acid, it is actually less reactive and would not take place. But there are certain reactions that do require something more than just water for the hydrogen. Sometimes you really do need sort of the acid as the source of the hydrogen to allow it to take place. So if we look at this calcium and water, and if we look over here where calcium is, really all you need is cold water for this reaction to take place. So we would expect the calcium to come in and kick out the hydrogen. Now, if we try to do that with lead, uh, which is here, you actually need acid uh, to supply the H plus there uh, for this reaction to take place. If you try to do it with water, it would not take place. Uh, but if you did react it with an acid, it actually would take place. Uh, so sometimes it can be a little bit more specific. But in general, you know, an activity series, uh, a lot of times you just have that list. Anybody higher on the list will replace somebody lower on the list. And anybody lower on the list will not replace anybody higher on the list. So we just talked about this a second ago, and obviously our halogens, our periodic table is basically our activity series. So when you're in group seven, uh, reactivity increases as you go up. So again, we have our uh, fluorine, chlorine, bromine, little iodine action. So once again, if I had chlorine trying to replace bromine, we're good. But if I had bromine trying to replace chlorine, not so good. So again, uh, that is how you use it. And that's what we see here. Chlorine replacing bromine, all good. Iodine trying to replace bromine because it's lower, not so good. And you would not get a reaction in that particular case. <clears throat>
Any questions on that there? Now, another type of redox reaction that takes place sometimes is what is known as a disproportionation reaction. It is actually the same element is both getting oxidized and reduced in the same reaction. So it's actually the same element that's going to be oxidized and reduced in the same reaction. Happens a lot in chlorine chemistry. So for example, here, if we look at this one, our chlorine on the left is zero. Uh, we did this guy before, minus two and plus one. Our oxygen here is minus two and the chlorine here would be plus one in this case. The chloride here would be minus one. This would be minus two and plus one. So in the first instance, we have chlorine that is going to ClO minus, which is chlorine with a plus one oxidation state. Is that my oxidation or reduction reaction? What is happening with the chlorine here? Going from zero to plus one, it is being so it is going from zero to plus one, becoming more positive, like increasing and decreasing. It is becoming more positive, right? Which means it is going through oxidation, right? So in this case, this guy is going through oxidation. Now in the same reaction, we have the same chlorine we start with ends up as Cl minus. And in this particular case, the chlorine is going from zero to minus one, right? On that side, which means it is becoming more negative and being reduced. So this is what a disproportionation reaction is. The same element is simultaneously being oxidized in one case and being reduced in the other. And this is how you would start your half reactions, right? Starting with the same guy on each of them, yeah. Any questions on that? So it happens a lot with chlorine and some other elements, but chlorine is very popular that it does occur. Um, <clears throat> so any questions on any of those ways to classify? So here's some uh, reactions. Uh, this is a redox reaction, right? Uh, <clears throat> this is uh, basically, I'm sorry, this is a double displacement basically and a precipitation reaction that's occurring here. Over here, this is an acid base reaction. This is our single replacement reaction that's happening, also a redox reaction. And this is a synthesis, our combination and uh, also a redox reaction, right? That's a net ionic equation we're looking at at the very first one there, yeah. which was the root of a double displacement reaction, basically. <clears throat> any questions on any of those there? So to summarize sort of the reactions that we talked about here, so again, the two sort of big classifications of reactions is our double displacement. And underneath that umbrella, we have our precipitation reactions, the more specific way of classifying, and our acid-base reactions. And really, as we talked about there, this guys take care of those two reasons why reactions take place precipitate formed or water formed. Then pretty much everybody else is gonna fall under the umbrella of redox reactions. That's gonna be your synthesis or combination. That's going to be your decomposition reaction. That's gonna be your combustion reaction. That's going to be your single replacement reactions. And again, all of these guys basically take care of the electron transfer reason of why a reaction takes place. So those are really, again, as we saw, 
you can classify the same reaction many different ways, depending on what you're looking at. So you want to choose the most appropriate classification based on probably the question, I suppose. Any questions on any of that there? All right, we were laid up there for today here.